coordinator here for the workshops. I'd just like to introduce um, Dr. Reddy and Chuck Hankins from JN International. Um, Thanks to NGP for this opportunity to introduce uh, Jane International Medical Corporation to the great audience of today. As Dr. Simon Orchid uh, mentioned, that there is an enormous uh, opportunity in the business growth for biomedical business in the future. We all must be proud to be here in the great country the Netherlands, where the microscope was invented by Van Leeuwenhoek, and it made possible to the human eye can see small infectious bugs. So to say, the first biomedical research was started here in Holland. However, I should emphasize, germ warfare is not over. We have a long way to go to find the medical solutions for major infectious diseases, such as HIV, hepatitis C, herpes, and other infectious diseases. We don't have a permanent solution for neurological diseases and disorders. The world has been spending billions of dollars on stroke, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and other CNS disorders. I should say the main reason is human brain is less understood in the science. It is so complicated, it's, uh, scientists are unable to understand how the mechanism of the brain works. At Jail International Medical Corporation, since 20 years, my colleagues and I tried some solutions to for stroke and all times by developing a rapid diagnostics and therapeutic peptides for stroke and all times. We are proud to say we have some solution to intervene stroke and all times before they occur. <coughs> We also developed meningococcal meningitis zero group A, C, Y, and W135 vaccine. A meningococcal disease outbreak in sub-Saharan Africa kills thousands of thousands in each year. We even create a roadblock to the disease spread during the outbreak season by vaccinating the people in the villages in 180 to 260 degree radius and able to stop the disease spread. Now we have this vaccine, can be used for toddlers and also the age two and other. However, we could not cross the regulatory barriers to make these products commercialized. We are a small and private company and offer for collaborations to make our medical inventions to reach people in an exponential way. My executive director, Mr. Chuck Hankins, is a microbiologist. will present about our company, about our research and development, and the products. Thank you. As Dr. Reddy was mentioning, um, I couldn't help but think my experience here of uh, all the first. And uh, first of all, I'm going to promise that we will be out of here in time for lunch. So. I'll watch the clock, but uh, I was thinking about all the firsts. Uh, for me, it's the first time to Europe, first time to, to meet a lot of you, and uh, I think I saw at, at the same time, you, you, you kind of, well, who's JNN? It's kind of the first of you hearing of, of who JNN is. So uh, what I'd like to do is, is to uh, go over what JNN is, who we are, what we do, what we have to offer, and uh, obviously Dr. Ray's kind of summarized some of those things. Hopefully I can, I can do this justice and go into a little bit more detail and answer those questions as we go along. Uh, JNM is located in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, that's basically the geographical center of the United States. Uh, we have a, a facility there that uh, is composed of two buildings. Um, there we go. Uh, JN is uh, obviously a small biopharmaceutical. Uh, some of the things that we're specializing in is meningococcal vaccine. Uh, also some of the CNS disorder rapid diagnostics and uh, expanding into the, the peptide therapies 
for the CNS consumers as well. Uh, some of the things that make us different is the, the kind of technologies that they we're coming up with and what we're working on. The, uh, the product line that we have, uh, as I said, it's a, it's a meningi uh, meningitis vaccine, ACYW135, the polysaccharide conjugate vaccine. There are two other companies that have the conjugate vaccine on the market. Uh, some of the things that differentiate us is that we're looking at a little bit different uh, demographic in our market. Uh, being a small uh, company, uh, our, our profit margin will be a little bit lower, and we can go to these areas and really service the people that are being affected by meningitis in the Sub-Saharan Africa area. Uh, we're also looking at neurological diseases. Um, these are some of the things that we've been working on with the peptide therapies, and I'll show you some evidence uh, further on in the presentation about uh, some of the, uh, the actual benefits and preventive, uh, um, preventive characteristics that we're seeing. We're also uh, working on rapid diagnostics. Dr. Reddy's got uh, a long history of rapid diagnostics. These are basically the cartridges that are similar for a pregnancy test. Uh, you can utilize the same technology uh, for many different things. We're working on analytes right now uh, that are going to go into uh, uh, stroke uh, and indicators of other CNS disorders. Uh, again, JNM IC is or uh, IMC has uh, been trying to get out into the, uh, the global environment. Uh, Dr. Reddy makes it uh, quite a, uh, an effort to get out and uh, make our name known, get involved with uh, Clinton Global Health, uh, WHO. Uh, some of the other efforts that are trying to work and get some of the, uh, the vaccines into the, the needed countries uh, like Africa and the Middle East. Uh, as I said, we've got a facility there. This is actually a, an older for, uh, Pfizer facility. Uh, it's composed of two buildings. The one on the top is uh, an older facility. Uh, the one on the bottom is actually an EU vaccine manufacturing facility. It was built in 03. Uh, it's uh, kind of mothballed in 07. Right now we're working to bring that back up in production. It's a, a top shelf facility. It was made, built to make vaccines. Uh, it's very, very impressive. Some of the internal components, uh, 1,000 liter bioreactors. Um, it's uh, fully equipped and uh, ready to go. And one of my responsibilities is QA and regulatory, so I, I get work on trying to get this validated and uh, get the certifications we need so we can go into production. Some of the partners that we've been working with and Dr. Ray's been working with, again, are some different areas that uh, are more underdeveloped. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, meningitis belt, uh, Middle East, Southeast Asia, and, and South America. These are some of the areas when you, when you look at the incidence of meningitis that are truly affected and uh, have problems. Some of the other things, as uh, we mentioned before, the rapid diagnostics and therapy. The acute stroke is, is what we're really focusing on right now. I'd like to go into a little bit more detail with that particular product. Uh, stroke, as everyone knows, uh, we've been talking to a few people here, and I think everybody can say that in their country there's been a real awareness and effort to try and educate people about stroke because it's such a major problem. Uh, the AHA uh, statistics just in the states, uh, 800,000 Americans suffer stroke each year. Of that 800,000, 87% are the uh, ischemic style, uh, but uh, there's 23% that are recurrent, meaning that these are people that had maybe TIAs, they had many strokes, and then they had uh, further strokes because the, the root cause really wasn't addressed. Uh, working that out, you've got a stroke every 40 seconds, um, a death every four minutes, so it is major. Financial impact uh, in Europe, 139 billion, 139 billion euros for neurological diseases. Uh, Americans, 74 billion, and this is mostly for, uh, for hospitalization and rehabilitation. Um, when someone gets a stroke, there's a neurological damage that uh, causes such a long hospital stay and rehabilitation. Uh, I'm sure everybody can think of an instance where, where it's taken months, if not years, for someone to uh, totally get back to 100% after, after suffering a stroke. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to, to show here was that the Sub-Saharan Africa region is right here, and this is called the meningitis belt. Uh, you also have the Middle East and some of these other areas, but what I want to point out is that when people have a stroke in this area, in the underdeveloped areas here, you can see that, that basically their life expectancy is reduced uh, significantly, 10 to 20 years. And that's just because of the, the, the health care that they have there and uh, the problem of, of not getting a stroke diagnosed quickly enough. Uh, as Dr. Reddy said, the, the brain science is, is poorly understood. Uh, it's, it's a difficult field to be in with the, the CNS disorders. Um, and we continue to, to forge forward on that. Uh, as far as the stroke, what we're looking at is ischemic stroke. This is the blood clot that lodges in the MCA or one of the brain arteries. 
just to, to show the, obviously the, the features of the, the symptomology is, is going through a lot of the programs, uh, face and some of the other things, getting people to try and recognize what the symptoms are. But uh, it can be from a plaque buildup, it can be uh, from a blood clot that, that forms somewhere else in the body and then lodges in the brain. Uh, and this can be either a minor event like a TIA, which is what we're showing here, or it can be a major event, which is a full-blown ischemic stroke. The thing with the TIA that uh, we need to remember is that, uh, by definition, it's less than an hour, symptoms less than an hour. Many of the last less than five minutes, many less than a minute. So people being people, many times it's ignored. And uh, this is very similar to walking around with high cholesterol trigs, um, LDLs. I mean, it's a precursor to a stroke. We need to get people aware that they need to seek medical help so that they can get prevention and intervention so that they can prevent that major occurrence of ischemic stroke. Types of stroke, as we've said, ischemic hemorrhage. Uh, this is just an intracranial uh, bleeding. We'll see this uh, sometimes with an ICH, is what we'll say. But uh, the majority is going to be ischemic, 88%. The TIA, 3%. I think that's underreported. And the reason why is that people ignore the symptoms. They don't go to seek treatment because it's over and done with within a minute or two. And uh, they don't follow through. Those are the ones that continue to be that 23% uh, proportion of people that have a recurrent stroke. Currently, the limitations in a stroke diagnosis is the, uh, the area that we're trying to focus on. Right now, if someone is getting the symptoms, again, people being people that kind of ignore it until it gets severe enough, and then they'll call for emergency response. Once they call for emergency response, they're transported. All this time, the clock is ticking. They get to the hospital, the doctor starts from scratch trying to do a diagnosis, CBC, imaging, all this stuff. It can be anywhere from one to two to sometimes six hours before someone gets treatment. By that time, the neurological damage is done. TPA is something that comes up for, a, they call it a, a clot buster. Um, they'll administer this when you've got a, a, a clot in the brain. If you actually look into it, the TPA is a rather risky um, type of uh, treatment. And in the states, less than 3% of the people that have ischemic stroke actually undergo this treatment. So again, you've got a clot, you may be having some treatments that take a little bit longer. That neurological damage is continuing, and uh, that's what costs all the money. For the rapid uh, intervention, what we're looking at is trying to shrink that window. We want to help with the diagnosis of the stroke so that the treatment or intervention can be implemented much sooner. If we can do that, then we should be able to lessen the effects. Uh, pathogenesis of stroke, um, the interesting thing about it is we're going to talk a little bit about biomarkers. Your body actually can feel the stroke starting and stressing the body. These biomarkers actually start to increase in titer. So the pathogenesis of the stroke starts before the symptoms are there. It's not an immediate thing. If you're talking an ICH, then it is. But when it's something that's an ischemic stroke, it's usually something that's building up in the body until it finally lodges in a critical area and causes enough uh, blood circulation problem. Uh, right now, most of the time you'll go in and you get some type of imaging so that they can actually see that the blood circulation has been uh, compromised and be able to locate uh, the embolism or the, the blood clot. The stroke uh, from the American uh, Heart Association has actually put a, uh, a goal out there that they would like to see treatment, decisive treatment, within an hour. With the current circumstances of uh, the patient transport, diagnosis, and the timeline, that's a very lofty goal at this point. But when you look at uh, the genesis of, of the, the brain damage that happens, um, it's critical that, that that be a goal that, that be reached. Uh, the diagnosis, again, mostly on clinical grounds, and you've probably heard of the stroke scale, NIH, uh, Australian stroke scale. They're looking basically at the severity of the, uh, the symptoms and trying to gauge the severity of the stroke from that. The problem is when you use just those type of uh, um, visual assessments, you can confuse those symptoms with other uh, disorders that could be a, a CNS type of disorder. What we're looking at is trying to basically make that a more clear, definitive decision. Blood brain barriers uh, involved with this. Uh, when you undergo some type of stress, like a stroke, um, heart attack, things like this, the permeability of the BBB changes. One of the items that I, that I wanted to bring up is that when we talk later about uh, our proposed therapy, um, 
one of the, many of the pharmacological treatments actually are small molecule and are able to go across the DVB freely, whether the person is having the disorder or not. This is going to be uh, in contrast to, to something that we're working on, which is a peptide therapy. At this point, we're getting into the technical stuff, and I would like to, to have Dr. Reddy explain a little bit about our, our receptor here so that I'm, I'm sure that the, the information is accurate. This is the MMDA receptors. These, the MMDA receptors are very abundant in the human brain. Something like uh, this is. Oh, okay. This is the magnesium block, actually. What happens is when there is a. Something happens like a TAA or maybe a stroke or some other non serious disease. This magnesium block will be removed. And the calcium will be reflexed into the body and causes the excited oxygen in the brain. That causes the stroke. Uh, that is the first thing that happens before the clot forms. The clot is the secondary, the advanced infection of stroke, but this is the primary pathogenesis of the stroke. That what we are trying to do is why why this happens, why this magnesium block is removed, is due to the uh, <coughs> Uh, due to the abnormalities in the body, uh, some of the serine proteins that causes the back brain barrier, barrier and we usually cleave the portions of the MR1 and the MR2 portions. When the cleavage occurs, then the CNMD receptor gets modulated and the magnesium block will be removed and the calcium, the calcium will be flexibly come into the, uh, into the brain cells. When the excess of calcium, what can happen is it causes a neuro degeneration to the neuron cells. That's what happens is within the, with the time gap of one or two hours, that could happen by the time the patient reaches the hospital, 50% of the uh, neural da damage occurs to recover the calcium in flux. What We have developed some peptides to protect these uh, areas of not to cleavage. If that happens, if that can be proved in human, then the magnesium block will not be removed and could save the uh, stroke patient. Thank you. So what we're looking at uh, developing here is a rapid diagnostic uh, for the stroke. And we're looking at the biomarkers which are associated with the NAMDA receptors that Dr. Jerry Reddy was just talking about. Uh, what we like to do and what we're working on right now is incorporating those receptor peptides uh, directly onto the uh, diagnostic kit. And what we're looking at being able to do is diagnose the person uh, earlier in that, uh, that uh, total time frame. Uh, right now you've got, uh, again, the awareness programs, the, the, the stroke uh, uh, severity scales. If there were a biological or a serological confirmation, um, even during the transport of the patient to the hospital, the intervention, the treatment could be started so much sooner. Again, the, the, the timing is critical when we move forward on this. Sorry, the next page, there we go. Uh, just to, to illustrate this in, in kind of a, a schematic format, you've got um, the actual stroke occurring here with the symptoms. And once you get into this point where the ischemic stroke has occurred, this is where the, uh, the, the neurological cascade uh, with the NAMDA receptors is actually happening. This is what's responsible for the brain damage from the neurological degeneration. So you've really got two things going on here. You've got a blood clot which is causing a circulation problem that's initiating or kicking off this molecular cascade which is actually responsible for the brain tissue damage. Obviously the brain tissue damage is what is responsible for the long rehabilitation and the hospitalization. What we're trying to do is to, to bring that window and expedite the process. Our, our product is a rapid diagnostic. Um, we have a lot of experience with rapid diagnostics uh, in the field with uh, HIV, um, tuberculosis, uh, drugs of abuse, even pregnancy type. What we'd like to do is utilize that same technology with the analytes that we've developed, the peptides we've developed that are the serological markers for stroke. This just illustrates uh, the simple, uh, if you think about a pregnancy kit, um, you put down a drop of blood, a drop of serum, it migrates across the, uh, the, uh, the medium and uh, gives you a qualitative result. 
Um, you get a blue line or you don't get a blue line. So it's either good, good news or bad news. But uh, this is the same type of technology that we're going to incorporate into the rapid diagnostic. Again, we're just showing kind of uh, the actual instance where we're looking at trying to, to get the rapid diagnostic implemented. The markers for the NAMDA act, uh, activation and cytotoxicity is what's proving or showing a definitive uh, um, diagnosis that the stroke is happening. We can do this with the peptide, which gives us the sensitivity and the specificity, as opposed to other type of diagnostics, which could have cross-reactivity and actually um, show maybe a different condition that's actually going on. This is very similar to uh, some of the other indicators that you may have uh, had some experience with. Troponin is another one for cardiac. So really we're looking at using the same type of indicators uh, that already exist out there for other conditions. The, the novel stroke test, we're looking at trying to incorporate into an ambulance setting. Again, when someone has a stroke, timing is critical. Um, you need to get the, uh, the intervention and the, and the treatment as quickly as possible. With the stroke assessment and a serological confirmation, we should be able to see that we can shrink that resulting window. So if you can diagnose up here, even in a TIA type of situation, you can uh, um, start your therapy. And the next logical um, extension for the peptides that we've uh, expressed is being able to use those peptides as a therapy as well. So this is something that we're looking at uh, going towards after we, we do the diagnosis is that uh, I know a lot of the conversations I've had today is if you have a rapid diagnosis, that steers you towards a treatment. So the logical extension here is that if we have the peptides that are specific for those, lock, um, those markers and you can do a, a competitive binding type of uh, um, strategy, uh, you should be able to circumvent or mitigate that molecular cascade that's causing the neurological degeneration. The interesting thing about this is that we've been emphasizing stroke and the NAMDAR receptors and the specific molecular cascade. If you look in the literature, you find that the same mechanism has been associated with other CNS disorders. Alzheimer's with the demographics of the world population, that's a large one. Uh, Parkinson's, Huntington's, uh, something else is uh, the NMDA encephalitis. Um, this is something that is kind of strange and that uh, we have a, a short video here that we were going to show and uh, it actually shows someone that had the NMDA encephalitis and how it actually affects the person, um, not just in their symptoms, but actually in their attitude, their personality. This morning on our special series, Today's Medical Mysteries, One Woman's Month of Madness. Just over a year ago, 24-year-old Susan Cahalan was a happy, healthy young woman. But last February, everything changed. We're going to talk to her in just a moment. But first, here's NBC's chief medical editor, Dr. Nancy Snyderman. I'd say it all started with the numbness. I woke up one day and I felt numb on the left side of my body. I thought, that's kind of strange. But her symptoms continued to get stranger. One minute I'd be really upset. I was crying at work hysterically, which is not like me. And then the next minute I'd be giddy and happy. I was completely manic. One night, things went from bad to worse. I remember we were watching On the Road again with Gwyneth Paltrow. That's it. That's all I remember. That would be the last thing Susanna would clearly remember for a month. We got a call around 1 o'clock in the morning, and her boyfriend Steve said that she's had a seizure and that she's at the hospital. And it was at that moment that I knew we were in for a very, very bad time. She was admitted to NYU's Langone Medical Center, but the team of doctors working Susanna's case had no answers for her parents. She was totally psychotic uh, and, and probably hallucinating. Thomas Cahalan wrote a journal to document his daughter's strange behaviors. The nights were the worst. She tried to run out more than once. It made her wear a bright orange wristband that read flight risk. Dozens of puzzled doctors and every test coming back clean, Susanna's condition was deteriorating. And then Dr. Suil Najjar, a top neurologist known for solving difficult cases, was called in to examine Susanna. When I saw her, I suspect she has a form of medical mystery. 
I know I'm facing uncharted territory. Dr. Najjar asked Susanna to draw a clock. All numbers on the right side of the clock face were filled, but none present on the left side of the face. After a month of mystery, the first clue. The right side of her brain, the emotional center which controls cognitive reasoning, was malfunctioning. A biopsy was done which revealed a rare autoimmune disease called anti-NMDAR encephalitis. Susanna's body was literally attacking her brain. The brain was uh, on fire. Now with a diagnosis, treatment could begin. Susanna received a plasma exchange and was placed on steroids to relieve inflammation in her brain. After eight weeks in the hospital, they finally let her go home. All I knew was that she was alive. And her spirit, and her spirit was intact. We had more hospital stays for treatment, doctor visits, and lots of medication to deal with. But my baby was on the way home. For today, Dr. Nancy Snyderman. Susanna Cahalan is now feeling 100% back to normal. She is with us along with Dr. Kenneth Alper, one of her doctors from the New York University. Really, the interesting thing here is that we're seeing a condition that we are um, actually expressing peptides for that is linked to many different uh, um, CNS type of disorders. Um, this one being probably one of the stranger ones that we've come across, but uh, it's autoimmune and it has to do with the same mechanism that we're addressing uh, with the stroke. The two pronged approach that we're talking about is initially with the rapid diagnostic. And as I mentioned before, once you get the rapid diagnostic, you can steer them towards the treatment, which would be the peptide therapy, which would follow that up. What we're looking at is being able to be part of that initial diagnostic process for the stroke uh, intervention. Being, getting, getting in there with the emergency response people and being able to, to be uh, part of the diagnostic portion of uh, getting someone to treatment quick enough. The protein or the peptide therapy, I should say, uh, that we've been looking at, uh, it sounds very conceptual, but we've actually, actually done animal models on this. And this is a representation here of, uh, this is a, um, actually a study done on pigs. And uh, what we were able to do is utilize uh, the NR1 and MDA peptide uh, against uh, pigs that were actually artificially induced with stroke. Um, you inject them with an ET1 and you're able to constrict the MCA. And actually this is a well-known model out there in the journal articles and constrict the MCA, which basically gives them a stroke. Now, one thing to remember when you do this in, a, in an artificial model is that it's usually a pretty severe stroke, uh, not necessarily indicative of the entire, entire type of stroke that a human would have, but it definitely shows it on an excessive uh, uh, basis. What we've got here is the lesion. So at 1 minute, 30 minutes, 60 and 80 minutes after inducement of stroke, by necropsy, the brain tissue was pulled and you measure the, the lesion. So here's our control groups here, and he's, here's the, uh, the treatment groups. You can see the size of the lesion was protected in both of the, uh, the treatment groups as opposed to the size of the lesion 60 minutes after a stroke. So again, it indicates that time sensitivity of once you have a stroke. We also done some other animal models that were, uh, that were done on rodents, and uh, they show the same type of same type of protective um, characteristics or improvement. And it's just a quick video here uh, where you can see the animals that were not protected with our vaccine. And this is actually a stroke inducement as well in a rodent model. So the animal's behavior you can see is not normal. Whereas the, the treatment group animals had normal behavior. They foraged, they drank water, and you can see the, the stroke and the... So we do have protective properties that we've been able to prove in a preclinical environment. So I've got one computer here, so we have to pop back and forth, but this is the last time, so we'll get it wrapped up. Okay, so the, the interesting thing here that I was bringing up is this mechanism that we're, we're actively working on with the peptide therapies linked to Alzheimer's as well. And what we're looking at is trying to 
take this technology and move it forward for some of the other applications that are out there. Uh, with Alzheimer's, it's almost like stroke as well. The progression of the disease is very slow and insidious, but if you can diagnose the disease early, there are a lot of pharmacological treatments out there that will slow that progression. A lot of times the diagnosis doesn't happen until very late in the disease, and by then it's very difficult to keep the progression of the disease getting to a debilitating uh, state, uh, state. Right here we're, we're looking at the, the receptor again, the synapsis. Here's your, your NAMDAR receptors, and then these are the cleave peptides that are, are um, coming off in that molecular cascade. This is actually what's, what's uh, allowing the, the amyloid plaque, which is what forms in the Alzheimer's patient. I'm sure most people have heard about that as well. So it's, it's a mechanism that's involved with this particular disorder as well. To move to the second side of our business, we also have a vaccine for meningitis. I mentioned this kind of in the beginning in our, in our pipeline products. Uh, the meningitis vaccine is a tetravalent uh, conjugate vaccine. And some of the interesting things with our, with our vaccine is that uh, we're going to be the third, pe or third, people that, uh, third person in the market to get out with this. But we have some things that make ours different. Uh, we have a different chemistry that uses less polysaccharide, induces a better immune response. It produces a better immune response in smaller children, which is really where you see the problem with meningitis. The nice thing about a conjugate vaccine is that you get longer immunity as you, uh, as you vaccinate people. Uh, one of the things that we're concentrating on is the areas uh, that are Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East, Southeast Asia. Uh, these are areas where meningitis, is, the incidence rate is very high. Uh, there's a high demand for meningitis. Uh, the African, Asian countries, uh, children that get meningitis have a very poor outcome. The morbidity is very high. So there's, a, there's quite a demand for meningitis vaccine there. Some of the other things that we're seeing in the world population in the Middle East Huge pilgrim, uh, pilgrim. A lot of people going to. <laughs> Sorry, I can't get over that word. Um, the pilgrimages uh, for the, the religious things. The Saudis have actually uh, required people that are participating in this to undergo and take the meningitis vaccine because they've had outbreaks because of it. The meningitis vaccine and conjugate uh, technology is patented. Uh, we've got that under our name, Dr. Jo Dr. Reddy's name. Uh, and that is a worldwide patent as well. Correct. The other parts for the uh, rapid diagnostic